So we're really delighted to uh, have rejoining us after a gap of multiple years, the wonderful filmmaker Larry Gottheim. He uh, co-founded the film program at Binghamton in the late 60s. He's made no end of wonderful films. We're just gonna see a couple of his early films tonight and then two newer works finished digitally which haven't played in Los Angeles before. Uh, and we're really happy to have you all share the evening with us. So please join me in welcoming Larry Gottheim. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. I live for these kind of occasions. I'm happy to have this program that has some early films and uh, the most recent works. I don't know. I, it seems funny to call them videos. I still call them films. But anyway, um, uh, I, I, I'll talk uh, in between the films. I just like to say that uh, my early films, of which Corn is one, were silent. And I just like to say that silent is not nothingness. I mean, silence is something. And. Uh, the absence of sound is not an absence. Uh, there's a presence of something. And so even in this film especially, uh, there is a kind of sound component. Uh, uh, I, I thought of it as a companion film to a film that some of you know called Fogline. Fogline uh, proceeds very uh, slowly and in a linear fashion through uh, something that involves the lifting of a fog the fog. So there is no, uh, you could say, there is no articulation. There's no points in it that particularly stand out from any other point. Um, corn was something that I conceived of as um, having uh, different kinds of movements uh, and almost sections, uh, and I'll talk about it a little bit after you see it. So let's see this one first. It's called Corn, and we'll talk about it soon. Uh, this is one of them, I sometimes have to call minimal, but they're actually maximal. Well, all of my films are maximal, although they're maximal in different ways. Um, this, of course, um, there's a kind of interplay between you and the film. I mean, the nature of the film exists in your own experience of it, which is in some way different for, for each person. I mean, there are a lot of things that I could say, and of course I've had, I don't know how many, 50 years since I made this film, so it's been with me. So of course I have a lot of things that I have thought about um, all that time, and also uh, the development of my films, like the latest films, which are seemingly and really also very, very different. Those are maximal in a way that's really obvious, um, but it's made me see things here that I hadn't quite thought of. I mean, for example, there is a, um, a, a ceremonial aspect to it, which is part of what led me in some later time to want to go to Haiti and get involved with voodoo and was uh, interested in that, but one can see it here uh, in the bowl. Um, um, also, when anybody, when anybody appears in one of my films, uh, there's something significant about it. So the person who appears in this film was my wife uh, who made that bowl. So in some way, it's a tribute to her, but it's also an offering. It's an offering to you, it's an offering, just an offering, whatever that means. There are things about the life of corn. Um, uh, what, what is amazing to me, uh, I've written a book about my work, is that, um, uh, well, I'll just say it. Um, what drew me to think about this was the light. Uh, there was a certain period of maybe a week. Um, there, there was a mountain, <coughs> Uh, a large hill next to the house, in back of the house, the garden was in between, and at a certain time the sun would um, set at that angle behind that hill, so that the light would shine in, this golden light, I think it was in July, would shine into this space uh, uh, that was like a theater, and I was trying to think 
uh, what, what do I want to put in there? I mean, this is an idea for a film, uh, and so the corn, of course, the corn came naturally because we had corn growing in the garden and so on. Um, uh, it has to do with painting to me. Um, it has to do with music. Um, it has to do with time. Time is something that always, for me, uh, is something different or more uh, than what time is it. Uh, I mean, there's the mundane time uh, that we all have to live under and with uh, in small ways as well as in the course of our lives. Uh, but there's something deeper than that. I mean, the clock doesn't really tell us uh, or open up to us what uh, something deeper about time. And um, I, I feel, for me anyway, this film uh, with this uh, sense of duration that you have to feel uh, opens up. I was very interested earlier and then later of these works. Uh, for example, Heidegger's great book, Being and Time, uh, whatever it's obscure, and I can't even say that I grasp it, but it, it supported me. And it was, it was uh, opening up the possibility that there's something about being and something about time and something about memory um, uh, that, that interested me, that I sort of feel, uh, or at least making these films allowed me to feel. Um, okay, so now the next film uh, was also in this period where I was using the whole role of film and that's also an important thing, that the time is, in a way, not arbitrary. The length of the film <coughs> isn't arbitrary, but it's the length of running a whole roll of film through the camera. And it's marked at the end by these holes uh, punched in the film that you're not supposed to see. It's just showing uh, what film stock it is. Um, uh, so a uh, fog line is also made continuously but it's uh, my first sound film. So let's see that and I'll talk about it a little bit after. <laughs> hmm. A lot going on. I know that of all my films, this is sort of like enjoyable. And <laughs> 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 it's fun, it's fun. <laughs> You know, you could sort of see it as a cartoon or something, but it's actually um, amazing that it happened and it's really quite complex. Like if you think about the car is like a theater, or it's like a movie theater also, in which out of the window we see a movie, and the plane of the window, which isn't there, it's open, but this um, penetrating outside of the window and inside of the window is full of implications. Um, the, the wind uh, is full of implications. Um, the scenery, uh, the sun even makes a little solo appearance when the car turns. That was part of the original idea. Just as in corn, uh, the sun, uh, usually it's hard to, to really focus on it, but the, um, the shape on this counter, there's not only the bowl, but there's the sun falling on the, um, on the surface of it, and the shape of it changes slightly through the time because the sun is always moving, or the earth is always moving. Um, uh, also, um, something that I've come to feel more so as time went on is that uh, I have this thing about avatars of me in films of mine, uh, different ones. Some of them, as here, is a positive one, and some uh, are negative ones. Uh, but he is actually the, the artist performer. And he's caught in this uh, web of time, uh, and he has to fill it out. And he's 
he's performing, whereas what I'm doing is I'm just kind of lying on the floor with the camera. So I'm passive and he's active, and that uh, tension between passivity and activity is uh, an important thing in my life as well as in the films. And even he is also, sometimes he's making the sound and sometimes the wind is making the sound. Also there's a kind of feedback um, because there are four people in the car. There's the driver of the car, the person with the sound uh, <coughs> uh, recorder, me hidden on the floor, and uh, the performer. Um, and there's a relationship because, uh, I mean, she's driving uh, partly relating to the traffic, uh, but also uh, she hears the music. So if she can, and the music is getting more exciting, she drives a little faster. And because she drives faster, the um, music becomes faster or louder. So it's, um, it's amazing. Okay, that's harmonica. Um, all of the films after this were uh, involved in sound and image relationships. And uh, one usually, I don't want to go wrong, but one usually thinks of sound as, well, we take it for granted, for example, in a sound film and the people are talking and we hear their words, uh, we take it for granted, we don't really think that here's one medium of sound and another medium of image. And then sometimes there's music and so on, but I'm, I'm thinking about um, how, to me, sound and image are almost like the same thing. Uh, here, of course, they are kind of the same thing because we see the production of the sound uh, so that the image is making the sound and the sound is making the image. But in other films, uh, I like to work with um, sound materials that came from another place uh, but they have some kind of uh, deep connection with the image and so editing <coughs> the image and the sound together uh, is very uh, it's the basis of a lot of my work um, that goes between this film and the, the next film many many years many films many parts of my life um, <coughs> but in that film, be because uh, it, it now was made with a video camera, uh, when you turn on a video camera, the sound is right there. So there's sync sound. This film has sync sound. So in Chance and Dances for Hand, all of the sound is sync sound. And I chose, uh, in working with all of this vast amount of material, um, pieces of sound and image where there was an interesting shape to each one. I mean, even though it was sync sound, uh, it was, there was a relationship between the sound and image. Of course, a startling thing uh, is that uh, the content of this film, a lot of it is because I was drawn to go to <coughs> Haiti and uh, specifically to get involved with voodoo. Um, I can't really go into it now, what would draw me there, but uh, you could already see in corn a, a certain kind of interest uh, in, um, not sacrifice, but something that could lead me to want to actually experience uh, things that had a certain form to them. And also, there were some things like a great filmmaker, Maya Darren, uh, had uh, gone to Haiti to study voodoo dance and never finished the film, but she wrote a very detailed book <coughs> about voodoo. Uh, but um, it was like a really long time. I mean, I'm talking about something like 25 years between when I shot the material and when I was finally able to uh, make something of it. Uh, and there were many things that were uh, troubling and pre preventing me. My life became extremely complicated, so I couldn't even think of really dealing with the material. Uh, and also, um, it was very complicated to deal with a whole other cultural uh, sphere, but I definitely didn't want to make a documentary about voodoo, even though some of this material could have found its place 
in that. Uh, and so it took me a long time to find, to realize that using this material, uh, I could do something that didn't have to, it wasn't a documentary about that, it was about some other things. So um, we'll talk about, I'll talk about that a little bit after we see it. Okay, so this is called Chants and Dances for Hand. Hand is the name of, um, <coughs> you see him as a baby, but this is a Haitian son of mine, um, and uh, his life was very complicated. That was another thing that um, inhibited me from working with the material. Um, and of course I like it, Chants and Dances for Hand, sounds like a little song. And um, Chants, of course, means chanting and also means chance. Um, all right, so let's see this. Uh, it's much longer. It's the longest film that we'll see. So I had, I had ordered the show with not not third and chance fourth, but we can swap them easily. Can we do that? Yeah. Okay. Of course, I'd like to do it chronologically. Is that easy to do? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Okay, good. Which is a whole different kind of medium, but really tortured me to, tr to try to be <laughs> away from working with film and sound, um, actual film. And, uh, you know what, um, you know the shot in the theater where they're showing, movie theater where they're showing platoon, platoon and there's this shadowy stuff you know, light flashes and just shadows they can't even see what it is. That that became the key to my making the film actually. Um, there, there was somebody I told a friend that I needed some help um, doing the computer editing. And so uh, eventually I had applied for I got something where one of her students was came to Yonkers for a week to help. And at that time, I didn't need that kind of help anymore. So I was just, she was sitting next to me while I was working. And I happened to be, I mean, in terms of the material, there was certain material that I knew was always going to be in the film, such as the Chinese movie thing, right? some other things. But that somehow hung on. Um, and that was the last thing. And I couldn't figure out like what, what to do with it. And then I realized I mean, it's, um, because it takes it away from this documentary thing. I mean, so that um, there are other, there are di different kinds of movies in it, like those movie theater, the Chinese movie, the TV set, um, the nature of electronic video, you know, where the burning, the burning body, where the steam is sort of like an echo, the, the smoke is like an echo of the steam in uh, corn from like 50 years before. Um, but there's this uh, video electronic distortion. That was not something that I put there. That was because the heat and the smoke and the stink and everything, the camera couldn't handle it. So I couldn't even see that when I was filming it, uh, only when I looked at it later. And it was like, um, and somehow in my mind, you know, at the end of corn, you see the um, uh, hole, the punched holes of the film. It's sort of asserting the film, and also uh, the film is not so grainy. But sort of towards the end of corn, um, I mean, I you can't help but looking to see if there's little vestiges of steam, and um, you know, at least for me, you sort of dig into the image. And um, sometimes it's a little bit of steam, but you're actually digging into the very stuff of the film, um, the emotion or the grain of the film. So here, the, the nature of this as a video, electronic video work is um, acknowledged by that. Of course, it's about death. The sacrifice, uh, that's the only thing that I ever saw there uh, where there was an animal uh, sacrifice. This was in an agricultural uh, community where the, 
I had been invited, I had gone there um, months before, and then the Ugon, the um, head of the, the priest of the Guru thing, said, you must come back in April when we have our major, uh, you know, so we read about that, about like Easter or Passover, you know, these are uh, events that really spring from uh, agricultural uh, things, so here it is uh, happening. Um, of course, the slaughtering of an animal uh, is uh, happens all the time to eat the animal, uh, but here it's in a kind of uh, ritualistic way. Uh, when those people are possessed and writhing on the floor, that's actually a very happy moment. I mean, this is the whole point of that kind of ceremony is for the spirits to come down and enter the community that's uh, participating in the ceremony, which, by the way, includes the spectators. I mean, there are a lot of shots of you know, just a crowd of people, um, and uh, spectating is part of the thing that I think about, like spectating a movie, um, movie theater, um, but spectating in a, um, in a ceremony is part of the ceremony just as the audience is part of the, this is a ceremony too. Everything is cooking, is eating, is. Um, so anyway, um, uh, it's a happy, the purpose of it is also with uh, perfume and uh, the music, uh, everything is meant to, to have the spirits come down and be really present so I was very interested, as you see in the next film, uh, with superimposition, because there's a kind of superimposition of the person. Like, you see the person um, still having the bodily form of themselves, but they've been taken possession of uh, the spirit. So the spirit is there, and the person is there, and this is what the whole point of it is. So when you see those people, it's kind of scary, to, to see them because they look like they're suffering, but actually you see these people dancing almost like a social dance. And of course, dancing itself, like social dancing, uh, comes from, it derives from uh, ritualistic dancing. Um, so here they are sort of dancing because it's, in, in some way, it's like a party. It's something to celebrate the, um, the spirit. Um, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but um, it's, a lot. it's intense for me to watch it. I hope it is for you. Um, of course, the things like at the beginning, um, the same woman that you see blowing my hair. It's amazing because the um, the book that I'm writing is called The Red Thread, and a thread and rope is really uh, a major um, image. Uh, very meaningful image in my work and it, it sort of has to do with the thread that connects all of the work and within the work even a film like this which has so much different information there's like threads that um, uh, everything is related to everything else in fact in not not the not refers to also the, um, the knot of all these different threads. But what they're doing, when they do this ceremony, for me, they're making this, uh, it's called a god, guard. It's a, a, a talisman that protects me, uh, made for each individual that goes through this thing. And it involves like the length of my body and hair and, and so on. Um, but um, it's amazingly wrapped with red thread. The, red, the thread is uh, the length of the thread has to do with the parts of my body. Um, anyway, so thread and rope. I was amazed um, where uh, the, in this uprising, which uh, we see things like this, or not exactly like this, but we see events like this um, on TV all the time, you know, you become immune to it. But this is the first time that I was in the middle of it. Um, but anyway, I, um, I saw on the, you know, this huge crowd of people. By the way, I was always, I never had anything but welcoming me, wherever I was. I, I mean, it's hard to believe, but it was true that 
um, you see that I'm right in the middle of this thing, and they're like, I, I became part of it. I mean, they didn't have any issue. In fact, they, I think, welcomed that it was be, was being uh, filmed by somebody that was willing to be a like, part of it. Um, lost the track. Um, oh, but anyway, uh, I I, um, I saw this building that was official building. All those buildings, by the way, got ruined in the earthquake. Uh, but uh, I saw this guards up on the top of this huge crowd, and I had this desire to go in there. So I walked up with this big camera, and I had my library card from the um, <laughs> university. So I showed them the library card. <coughs> I, I went in, and I went up the stairs to get to the balcony. And on the way, I saw this door open, and I saw this, um, these people bound sitting on the floor, and I knew I had only like a few seconds uh, to, to film it, but what struck me was that his hands were tied with this rope, and so I had to get an image uh, of that, and then I did go out in the balcony and look down at the people, and also the ceremony with the rope, of course, caught me by surprise also, um, like it was like I mean, sometimes I feel that things happen as though they want to be in the film. I mean, they, uh, or certain of the sound materials that I use that happen to be, um, they, they, they get tied into, the, into my own imagery so closely, it's almost as though you forget that they had another kind of life wherever they came from. Um, so it was like so, so many <coughs> events happened that were, um, important. There's also a kind of, of all the different movies, there's also this little home movie section of hand, like jumping up and down and, and doing stuff. Um, all right, I mean, I could go on and on, but, uh, and hopefully I'm not picking out certain things because I think everybody would have certain images that you might remember or certain sounds that you might remember. Um, anyway, let's go on to the this last work is shorter, it's 20 minutes. Um, it, it came to me by surprise uh, that there were certain things that are brought together. Uh, maybe we'll just look at it and then I can um, talk. Or you can talk also. So not, not. Okay, got it. <laughs> <laughs> There's only a few blocks of material. Um, Ailey was one who, comp was comp who performs and sings that uh, music. That's the pulse thing, which. Oddly enough, it has to do with like multiplying and numbers and languages. And I was originally attracted to it because of the sibilance of the S sounds in uh, Spanish and Catalan. It's four languages: Spanish, Catalan, English, and Italian. Um, down the street from where I now live, I mean, my early films were all. Um, filmed in the kind of landscape around where I was living. And now I was living um, in a city, uh, well, I grew up in, a, in New York City, but I was living in a city thing. And down the street was this graffiti thing uh, on a sort of indented wall that you could pass by it uh, easily. And um, as you can see, it's like an image of uh, a girl on the other person's shoulder and writing these words, and the words that you could just make out is les enfants terribles, mm. <laughs> uh, but it's been crossed out, and that's what really attracted me was the crossing out, um, which led me to think about some issue of uh, philosophical issue, like in Heidegger and so on, of erase, erasure, uh, that is crossing something out, <coughs> but yet it's still visible. 
which, which is what happens with the superimposition. I always wanted to do something with superimposition. Um, the, um, so through her, I was looking up stuff on YouTube and so on, and I came across this documentary about uh, the conductor Wilhelm Fortfängler. So all of the material um, was culled from that documentary, which is not a particularly, you know, it's sort of an awkward documentary. This is not like about the documentary, but in some way using the documentary. So everything that you see from that material is just how it is in the film, like if there's a still frame or dissolve or, or the war footage, everything comes from that material or from the wall. Um, uh, I remembered because of this line, uh, this line that um, looks somewhat like a serpent, but also it's like a line that relates to the rope. Somehow this reminded me of this uh, something I had shot a long time ago. Uh, I had, had some screenings in Hawaii, and I went to Pearl Harbor, um, and I filmed where the Arizona was sunk. Um, and I remembered this squiggly, you just see it a few times in the film, there's this kind of squiggly thing. So I tried to find that. I got that roll of film, and it had all turned red uh, from age, and the film can do that. Um, so anyway, I used that. Um, I had thought about using Black Leader. I liked using Black Leader in some other films, including in the Uprising section. But then uh, we went looking for some uh, Black Leader and came upon this leader that was all like scratched and had holes in it. And um, so that was great uh, body material. Um, one other thing was um, when I was on this tour in England, I had previously gotten this little but very powerful video camera, which I had never used. And we arrived in Manchester on the morning after this uh, terrorist uh, attack on uh, a nightclub. So I wanted to go as close as I could to that, uh, but I couldn't get very close. There was the police tape and so on. But that was the first thing that I shot with that camera, so there's images of that. So it's basically um, uh, combining uh, in very complex ways. Uh, I had this uh, young student, uh, Christian, who sort of showed up and he was interested, so he was helping me uh, manage the, um, the computer editing. And it was very tedious, as I said the other night. I mean, we would work for like a whole long session, a whole afternoon, and get 30 seconds uh, done. So it was like a lot. Uh, but I liked using Friday as a kind of template so that everything could be um, in a way edited to that. Uh, but then when we started with the superposition, it was very surprising uh, because the colors um, totally surprised me. I think there's a way uh, that probably everybody knows about who uses this kind of stuff, but you can actually superimpose in video in such a way that it has more like the natural colors. But when we superimposed it, um, it had these amazing colors that were so uh, important. So there's a lot of um, contrast like between the uh, graffiti as an image and the stuff, the crud on the wall. Um, you know, I was kind of wanting to make an art thing out of this, um, not the full scene of that graffiti thing, but of what was on the wall or on the edges or color. So uh, in some way, it's very, uh, it's about a lot of stuff. But I think of it being also about music and painting. Uh, so Forfangler, as some of you might know, it's a very complex thing. I mean, he was a really great conductor, um, but also he conducted during the Nazi period, and it's something that always had to be dealt with by him. He was also, for me, an avatar of Heidegger, who also was a very inspiring philosopher, but also was uh, maybe even more deeply implicated 
in some of the Nazi thing. And they are also, um, in, in some way, they're avatars of me, um, like the harmonica player, only very complicated. I mean, I was not a Nazi, uh, but I have, um, and I, I don't know how to say it, I have like a dark side. I mean, it's not like you would find it in a film noir, but I mean, things that I'm ashamed of or whatever, so that there's this striving for beauty and also dealing <coughs> with the, um, the other side of, of beauty. So uh, in some way, uh, Fort Fengler, who created such beautiful music and also was implicated in all of this not impl well, he was just con con conducting during that period. Um, is something to speculate about. I mean, you can't say that he was um, a great conductor because of that. I mean, actually, despite that. Uh, so Sorry. there's a lot of things. Yeah. Can you um, talk about how you mean avatar? You say this a lot, and you know, yeah. we know obviously we know the word. I'm not even sure right. that that's the right word. There's some other words, but it's like something that stands for for something else. I mean, um, and it's very complicated going through all of my films. I mean, I wasn't even so much aware of it. I was interested in this thing in connection with voodoo that. Um, uh, I'm sure you've seen, like on the walls of uh, uh, Hispanic people, uh, there are these pictures of saints um, that, that are put on the wall, and uh, they represent uh, different saint, Catholic saints in their, um, you know, with, like with the sword and on a horse or whatever it is. Now, in uh, voodoo, um, those are also um, images of, of, the, of the spirits. In other words, they will have them on the wall and they, you will say, who is that? And they'll say, it's this spirit. In other words, this image of a person is also a representation of, of the spirit, uh, just in the way um, in possession, um, the person is also representing. So I was just thinking about that, but th so that made me look back at, for example, Harmonica uh, and, and other films where there are um, figures uh, that are in some way like parodies of me. Like, um, like in one film, there's a documentary. I mean, in, in the film, one of the bodies of material is a, a documentary uh, about uh, paranoia, and there's this uh, doctor who like, lectures about paranoia, and then you see him. And I saw that as a ironic um, reference to me, or um, I don't know how to explain it. And so I wasn't sure what word to use. So avatar seemed like uh, that kind of word. I mean, in the book. It goes into it more through the whole book because most of my films are in between those early films and Chants and Dances for Hand. So in those films, these things are more uh, developed. It's also, um, a lot of my films are sad. I'm sad. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, these films are also about death, um, less obvious than in Chance of Death is for him. But, um, of course, superimposition, I was thinking that sound and image are always a superimposition. In other words, when you start to think about them mm -hmm. uh, uh, as some, somehow the same, then if somebody's talking on the screen and you hear their voice, it's actually the voice is superimposed on the image of the person. Um, isn't it? <laughs> um, well, do you have anything? Because, you know, yeah. Um, earlier you said in the chants and dances uh, for hand, you said that it's also about death. 
but you paused and you didn't elaborate at all. Um, is there anything to elaborate or, or is it up to the interpretation of the spectator what he meant by this imagery of the corpse? Yes. And <coughs> well, I mean, one thing is that I have to contemplate my own death or also the death of people that are, you know, the, the, not the burning horse, but the child who was probably an innocent victim of this violence, or the, the dead child um, reminded me. I always had this feeling in other films, I had, uh, well, like my son that you saw was from an earlier period of my life where I had a son and a daughter, and I was always afraid uh, there are certain times when I felt that they were very fragile, and so that has always haunted me, like the death of children, and so on. And also death of, in nature, I mean, nature is this cycle of birth and death. I mean, it gets to be, to talk about it gets to be too grandiose. So, um, but I do have uh, sort of grandiose aspirations uh, but actually, when I work on the film, it's very, um, it's like handiwork. It's very concerned with um, like what it will look like to superimpose this and that and that sound and, uh, as though it's almost like a puzzle or a formal thing. I'm not always thinking of, um, you know, of what it all means, um, but it happens that amazingly it, it has those and I'm sure there's a lot of things that I don't even see in it because it's so complex that, um, well, that's just how it is. Or well, I'm sure there's things that you can see or think about that then belong to the experience of the film that I, don't, I, I haven't thought about. Well, this is a very meaningful situation over here <laughs> for me and um, overwhelmed with awe at you. I find that it's recently something happened in the world. Uh, it wasn't always like this, like with those films, the early films, um, you know, people would fidget, they would get up and we, uh, I have a film, Barn Rushes, uh, which is made of sections, uh, it's not an exact repetition, but the barn mm. appears and go on to it and then again. And uh, I had this screening at the Museum of Modern Art where it used to be that I think it was free in the afternoon, so people would come in uh, if it was like a rainy day or something and see the film. And when I showed that, you know, the first two sections um, went by, when the third, se and there's eight sections, when the third session <laughs> people said, oh no! <laughs> <laughs> um, so that doesn't, but it is a great thing. I mean, and I also like that when I'm in the audience for other films, it's not just the point, you know, when you're sort of sitting there and you feel the energy of the attention of, of people, it's, it's really great. It's like music, I mean, I think of, watching films also like listening to music it's, I mean, the kind of you know I mostly like classical music or um, jazz but there are references to classical music even this violin in the beginning of an end of Chance and Dances for Hand is a kind of other is a lot of things but she uh, who is Hand's mother is also possessed I mean, there's various <coughs> kinds of possession, but through the course of the film, you, so, you see people and they have a certain expression in their eyes, like they're looking in, in some way, and that's a kind of possession that happens. Um, so it's not only in these ceremonies, um, just as um, the pounding um, <coughs> in that big thing that's part of um, a ceremonial thing, uh, creating uh, mixtures of 
leaves and, and stuff that will be used throughout the year. But in every kitchen, there's also this little uh, pilon, you know, where they, um, you know, prepare the spices for cooking. Um, so that may be think about. That finally, uh, all the things from ceremony are also in. But I don't want to be like preachy about it. I mean, these are not texts; they're films. What was the approach to editing chants and dances? Well, um, for a long time, I was also inhibited from messing with the material because I felt that I owed some kind of responsibility to it. I couldn't figure out. So finally, uh, and I kept whittling down the material I had because I was going there for a period of like four years, not all the time, but when I could. So I had a lot of material. Most of it was like ruined by being too hot or something was wrong with it. But still, I finally decided um, to organize it by um, by ceremonies at first. Um, so I had uh, like a bin with all the stuff from a certain ceremony. Then I decided to mix uh, more than one ceremony. Um, but it was easy with that film editing because I could see everything. So I would work on it <coughs> one section at a time. Um, and oh, oh, I had trimmed the shots. Like that was something that I always did before I was working with it. Is I would, uh, as I said earlier, I liked things where there was a, uh, a a shape because of the sync sound. Uh, so I would choose sections like that, and then I would fuss with it a lot. Like where does it begin? Where does it end? And finally, I would get it exactly as I would want it, and that made it relatively easier that when I decided to put this next to that, the shots were already, um, I mean, I could change it a little bit, but they were already kind of like what I wanted. And then uh, I, I had this material that I um, wanted to include that didn't ha have, have a ceremony, like the Chinese movie or the movie theater or some other things. So then this idea of this interludes uh, came into it. And then the structure is uh, something like the structure of a ceremony in that it, um, okay, first of all, it goes forwards and then backwards. Um, and turning around, and that's something that always interests, not always, but interests me, is um, forms that go backwards, for example, in music, um, uh, canons that, um, go forwards and backwards, but in a ceremony, you see a good example of it um, in, the, in the dance where this girl in white, several women dancing, that's another kind of uh, possession. But at one time, uh, you see the guy with the striped shirt is the Ugon of that particular community. And what happens is that uh, it starts to you, it starts to get into the zone of, of of possession where the drumming changes. They'll like spray perfume in the air, and then um, what he does is he turns somebody around, <coughs> and and that uh, and also there's this pole that you see that's always in the middle of the place where they do these ceremonies, uh, and it's in the center and it has a um, like a little circle around it. And so they're dancing in this direction uh, around, the, the, around the thing. And then if they turn around and start dancing in the other thing, that's like often the inauguration of a ceremony. So that in the, in the film, the um, sections, uh, the main sections, when it's part two, it's actually different material. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same ceremony, but it's new, new material. In the interludes, um, it's the same exact material, but in reverse order. But that's tricky to kind of grasp it. So I was thinking. Um, I mean, I've, I've often been drawn.